You are listening to the After the Timeout podcast, hosted by Todd Zazadil and John Palicki, two high school head coaches looking to help others spread their passion for the game of basketball. Tune in for episodes about anything basketball related, on the court, off the court, and anything in between. We at the After the Timeout podcast would like to take a full timeout to talk about V Reps basketball. Coaches, do you get frustrated by how some players just cannot seem to learn your offensive system? Are you spending countless hours teaching your offensive system to your team just for them to forget by the next practice? You should check out V Reps. V Reps was founded by basketball players and coaches to create tools that make learning plays easily a reality. V-Reps allows coaches to turn their 2D playbook into a 3D interactive video game that players can watch on any mobile device on their own time. Don't just have players watch film, have them live it and control the players so that they have a better, more efficient learning experience. It's free to try. Go to vreps.us to sign up today. On today's episode, we are joined by Ryan McCarthy, head women's basketball coach of Alaska Anchorage University. We are bringing the mayhem back to start off season two, the same way we started off season one. So coach, welcome back. And how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks so much for having me. All right. So uh, last time we talked, kind of in limbo, right? Um, Then you got out, you got to play some games. You got to to put the mayhem in effect. and we've talked to a bunch of coaches in the meantime. So I guess, how, how did it go? Um, you know, and then it's always interesting what the process was to be able to play because everyone has a different story. So maybe a little background on that. Um, you know, I was, I was really pleased that we were able to play and that our, um, you know, the university made a, um, you know, a financial commitment to back that for us to be able to make some road trips down and, so we were all really appreciative of that, um, but it became very apparent to me that, you know, when we got to the competition part, that we just weren't ready, and um, we ended up canceling our last two games, um, you know, out of some caution, but some mostly due to the fact that we did not pay the price to be able to play, and so while we wanted to, and I, I do believe that the games that we played were in the best interest of the student athletes, you know, mental well-being, um, it really taught me a lesson, you know, as a young coach that, you know, uh, I've never believed in what we do more than I do now, um, in terms of, you know, just the the culture of competitive excellence and the price that you have to pay to to maintain that. I just kind of felt like we lost our edge a little bit. It was, you know, in Alaska, you have to play everything with your um, your face mask the whole time. We had some different kind of protocols that we had to follow that didn't really simulate gameplay. So we couldn't simulate a game. We couldn't even get referees to to do an inter-squad scrimmage up here. Um, So our first competition of any kind was um, when we went and played Multnomah University down there. And we just didn't play to our standards. So I was disappointed in that. But at the end of the day, to no fault of the student athletes or the coaching staff, um, it was kind of to be expected, you know, when we were able to review everything. I think, I think that leads perfectly into, we were talking to Kelly Graves from Oregon and, you know, he just talked about the team development piece, you know, both on and off the court and how there was just such limited time, you know, on the court to, to develop that team, to develop your system, to, to just bring everybody together. So, you know, in that short time for you, just like us in in Illinois, we, you know, we had masks on at all times as well. In that short time, how did you go about developing your team both on and off the court? Well, um, you know, it it forced us to be creative for sure. Um, You know, we went into quarantine four different times for two weeks at a time. So we were um, in prison for more or less uh, for about a month at one point in time. 
And um, we obviously don't have our arena, so we are practicing in a rec center. Um, and my office was in a, uh, like a cardio room that we set up a table, my assistant and I, and just sat across from one another in there. Um, and, you know, even just being able to go to that space to go see someone familiar and like lock in basketball wise, I just think made us really appreciate, you know, what we had before, but in terms of building our team, you know, we didn't get to do a lot of the things we normally get to do. But we did do some special things. I, um, our team went out skiing one day at um, Alaska, the ski resort, about 25 minutes away. So normally on any regular year, I would never let our team go downhill skiing and snowboarding. And we, we did that. Um, we, you know, we did some things where we, we got an uh, online trainer um, just for kicks um, that put us through some stuff. He, he does some work with um, the Nike athletes at the Nike World Campus. And so... He did some stuff um, for us because he's a buddy of mine. And uh, I think the ladies really enjoyed that in quarantine because that was like something that like gave him structure. But that was the biggest thing. It was just as long as you could have some structure in your day um, and it didn't even have to be basketball stuff, but something that had to do with a team that had structure, that you had to wake up at a certain time, you had to, you had to be online at a certain time. You know, I think that helped us, but it just really um, became apparent to me that the one part, you know, our team got along great. We had some great discussions. We talked about, you know, um, the civil rights issues going on. We talked about, um, we had a, someone that worked for Dr. Fauci come on and talk to our team about viruses and COVID-19 and how those work and what the, uh, you know, the history of vaccines were because Alaska was getting vaccines before everyone else. So our ladies actually had one of the first vaccines available in the United States. Um, you know, just those kinds of things. But it became apparent that the one area that we did not develop was that competitive excellence um, piece. And, you know, normally we do that in conditioning. We kind of, um, oh, more or less punish it into them. You know, they suffer together. They go through some things mentally. They push down some walls. We take them out to the sand dunes, you know, down by the, you know, the cook inlet and um, you know, we do some really unique things that are kind of unique to the place that we stay that, that really push them, but really set what the standard is in our program. Because while we're not power five and we're not, you know, a big time division one, we're expected to win 30 games every single year and compete for a national championship. And there's not many programs in the United States, regardless of level, that have that standard. And so, um, you know, when you get here, ingraining that into them and telling, you know, really letting them know you did not meet the standard today. You did not win. You know, this is what you need to win. You need to meet the standard, make it happen. And we just never got to that point. And I think that ultimately hurt us. But uh, I think going into next year, um, in some ways, it makes us stronger because our team is so close and that we've all kind of gone through this, you know, are we playing games? We're not, you know, we, we, we give them four weeks for winter break. We come back. And then all of a sudden they tell us we can play games and it's like, oh crap, we don't even have baseline out of bounds plays yet. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just that kind of journey, but yeah. You know, we kind of had that in Illinois, actually. I, I remember doing an open gym and then all of a sudden the, the board for the Illinois uh, IHSA met and they were like, oh yeah, you can start tomorrow the season. And I was like, whoa, 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 time out, time out. I don't have anything in. So Buying by the seat of her pants a little bit. We, we were. So let, let's kind of talk about it. And you kind of started it, but let's go into it a little bit deeper. So now that this season has kind of quote unquote ended, what does your end of the year evaluation process look like with, with your players? You know, as a staff, what does it look like? And obviously, you know, for you, you know, what does it look like as you evaluate your players going forward? Um, there was a lot of honest meetings. Um, you know, I think the thing that, you know, we were able to establish during this time is that, you know, the coaches had their best interest. We love them. Um, we went with the best for them. And that during these games, they got exposed, you know, for lack of better terms. And so, you know, we were able to be really honest with them where we see their skill sets. And we kind of got to see as a coaching staff, like what we need to bring in from a recruiting standpoint to be, um, to better put ourselves in a position to be successful next year. And, you know, just from the competitive nature, I just graded them 
A through F on, on where I thought we were um, in terms of our competitive nature, you know, when we get onto the floor, um, our attitude as we get into the gym and, and get ready to compete. And, you know, this, every team that we have here says, oh, coach, you know, we're, we want to win a national championship. We're going to do that. Well, we have a team that made that game. And so the good part about that is you can measure that team against every other one that says they want to do that. And that team, I felt, had four or five A-plus competitors. You know, it, you're never going to have like a 10, a, you know, 10 or 12, all your kids are at that level. But we had about four or five really, they would, you know, borderline slap their mother to win a game. You know, I mean, they were just ultra, ultra competitive. And this, this year, we, did, we didn't have that level of competitor. Um, and, and part of that is, I think, um, it we hadn't been in a game in 400 days and we hadn't been through a preseason conditioning where, you know, man, if, if I don't win this exercise, I have to participate in the next exercise. Um, you know, politically speaking. Um, so I like that. I like the participation. Yeah, that's yeah, they, a good term. They told us that you can't make losers run. So I said, Oh, that's fine. Then losers, uh, the, the winners don't have to participate in the next exercise that we have. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, um, what, what we did in terms of evaluating what we had back. And, but I did think it really motivated our team and we showed them a really good um, documentary um, or I don't even know if it's a documentary, but it was kind of a, uh, a show on Hulu that I'll give you here. Cause this, this was the best thing that I've ever seen or read or anything. And it's called the standard. And it got to the heart of what we're about. Um, we built this thing. Our culture is, is very, very in line with the United States military. I think we talked about that before. And um, more specifically, the special forces. And, um, you know, the kind of team, you know, they're, they're all about team. They're all about camaraderie. But they're all about uh, pushing down whatever kind of mental and physical wall that you have. Uh, and they could really relate to a lot of those things by the way that how demanding that the cadre were and what they had to go through. And um, it basically took like um, CrossFit guy, like we all know CrossFit guy. And they took like 40 CrossFit guys and American Ninja Warrior guy. And they put them in this, con uh, basically they wanted to challenge themselves. So they sign up for this. And it's 48 hours of a condensed special forces training. And there's eight ex special forces guys that take these guys through two days of hell. And just to not give it all away, two people make it past 24 hours. And you get to see the difference in one guy that mentally breaks and he's all the physical tools to, to get it done. And one guy who came in and he was so prepared and he did all the you know, exercises to the max in his spare time that he was 100% confident that he was going to win. And he didn't care about anybody else, but he knew he was going to win because of the way that he prepared. And I think that really gave us some motivation as we head into the summertime and to get ready for that moment where I'm going to challenge them and I'm going to find what their weakness is when they come in in that preseason and we're going to have them push down some walls at that time. So, Coach, I found the trailer on YouTube. Where can our listeners find that? By listeners, I mean Todd and John. But where can our listeners find that video? Um, on it's a it's on Hulu. Uh, on Hulu, it, okay. Yeah, awesome. if you have a Hulu membership. So. Yep. Okay. Um, and, well, and hopefully, none of the coaches in my league have a Hulu membership. <laughs> the other, the other <laughs> tweak that I wanted to add to that question is just with that postseason evaluation. You know, how does that change right now with the eligibility and the transfer uh, rules that have obviously been put into place with, with COVID? Um, you know, we basically kept, you know, anybody that we felt needed to stay. And, um, you know, it only, we, I thought we were going to have to recruit six players, you know, before um, NCAA uh, put in the COVID rules. And we ended up only having to recruit two. So, you know, it gave us, you know, when I say the evaluation of the, the program, I kind of just mentioned the players, but just as important, it was a good evaluation of us coaches. I mean, I, I probably, I am more motivated after this year than I've ever been. And I feel like I've learned more about the game 
because that's basically all I did was just try to, you know, find podcasts like this or uh, brush up on watching some of my teams four and five years ago. I probably watched three full seasons of our games, you know, during this year. So it's kind of like, man, I, I let up in some areas or I need to improve in this area, you know, changing our offense a little bit or just tweaking it and, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I think we're going to be able to make some improvements there as well. I, I can't agree with you more on that coach of, of digging into, right. I was a first year head coach. I jumped in, you have all these big ideas, right. And you're like, and it, you know, didn't go the way we wanted to, but, but we did some really good things, but now it's like, okay, well, how can we, how can we fix that? Um, but we talked about transfers and eligibility and, and all that. I, I think this is really interesting because you, you look at the transfer portal both ways, men's and women's and, you know, and, and that has a tendency to filter down. Right. Um, like, what do you believe the long-term effects of, of this year and, and the extra eligibility and kind of the transfer rule changes will be. Uh, and then I guess, uh, what does recruiting look like right now? No, I, I think um, COVID in general hurt the 2021 high school class and probably junior college class. I think, um, you know, and then I think the people that get the most hurt in is probably the foreign 2021 kids. Um, is they're looking to come over? Because Typically, they kind of fill the leftover spots in, in some programs. I don't, I don't think a majority of the programs in the United States are really filling their roster with, with foreign um, players. That's an um, interesting point. I never thought of the foreign players. Yeah. You know, USF does it. Um, you know, there's a couple schools that really hit the foreign market pretty hard. Um, but, you know, most programs don't. And the 2021 high school class, the hardest part is the culture of, like, where high school basketball is right now. Because we're seeing a shift in the importance of club programs as opposed to high school programs um, because everybody's mentality has changed. And this is just my opinion. You know, when I was in school, it was win state. That you'd go in and that was your, your motivation. That's why you stayed late at the gym. And now everybody's motivation is win a scholarship. And that doesn't necessarily mean win a game. So as long as I play good and as long as I get my points and I'm playing in the tournament that all the college coaches are going to be at um, and I play for the biggest, best team with all the fancy gear, then, um, you know, I'm putting myself to accomplish what, you know, another one of my dreams is to play, you know, college basketball. And so now with the portal, the way that it is, um, you know, I think some coaches, it really benefits, you know, the coaches that know all the AAU guys and they're, they're buddies with everybody and they can ask, you know, so-and-so, hey, is, is this person happy where they're at, you know, or uh, I've seen a lot of tweets of student athletes themselves saying, oh, you know, that, that are done now. I, I think it was, um, you know, a, a player that had played at Duke said, you know, I, if this, this were my senior year, I would get um, all my friends that are really good and we would just go to a mid-major and make them really good my senior year. Um, and, and I personally disagree with that philosophy um, because when you sign up for a place, to me, you know, in college basketball, one of the most special things is that, you know, you're signing up to play for the name on your chest. It's the last opportunity you have because when you play pro, you're just playing for a check. I know that because I did, you know? And so um, when you play college, that's the most special time that you have in your whole life. Those are the people that are going to be in your wedding, most likely, you know, that's, um, you know, you, have, you know, your school fight song, you bleed your colors, you know, that, that kind of thing. And I think we're losing a little bit of that. And so college has become more of a business. And what ultimately is going to happen if they decide to go down this road is I told my team this, that, you know, if we were a business, I'd fire five of you. R really? You know, we're, we're not, I'm not a CEO, I'm a coach and I'm, I'm here, um, I'll die on the hill with you as long as you buy in. But if this was a business and this was pro sports and some of you showed up in shape the way that you did, um, you, you know, you came in with the amount of preparation that you did, you competed the way that you did in you know, one of our games. If we're pro sports, I'm saying, you know what, I really like you, but I can't pay you to do this, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that, especially like in football, 
field goal kicker misses a, a kick in the NFL, that guy's gone. In college, hey, sorry about your luck. You'll, you'll get it next time. You know, maybe they play the walk on, but then you get your chance again. If this is, if they're going to make this pro and all this, then you got to treat people like a pro. He misses that kick. Hey, sorry, hit the transfer portal, buddy. It ain't your choice this time. And so I think that that's the, the route that all this is, is headed. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think that there's not ever a place to transfer. I, I do believe that we've, we've been the benefactor of transfers, you know, that just, it just wasn't the right fit for whatever reason. But to me, in this climate, it's just got a bit out of control because people aren't always leaving for, you know, a, a, a truly, really bad reason. I think they're leaving because either they want to be recruited again because they like the way that feels, um, you know, they want the easy way out of something. And I think that if it becomes a business and they go down that road, then the, the, the student athletes are the ones that are going to be treated like pros. And I don't know if they want that. You got to be careful what you wish for. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> that, that was, I guess we'll follow up on that. Uh, right. You talked about if it was a business, you'd have five people. Um, I, I guess, how do we, I, I think that filters down all the way, even high school, like, Hey, we're, we're in the off season, you come in. Right. I mean, it, it's getting it more and more does. down to each level. Right. Yep. So how do we get our players to kind of buy into that? And like, Hey, this is kind of turning into, if you're going to commit at that level, at the level you're at, at the level that some of these transfers are at, even at the high school now, it, it's almost 365. Like, yeah. you got to be ready. Even if you're a multi-sport athlete and, and doing all these things, how, how do we get our, our players to kind of buy into the idea that they got to grind and they got to work um, all year? Um, or, or is it sometimes just have to be a hard lesson? Yeah, I think sometimes it has to be a hard lesson for sure. I think we've all learned the hard way at one point in time, you know, um, I remember the first time I didn't box out in a, in a AAU tournament, I turned around and I, I got dunked on, you know, right away. And that was kind of my lesson about working hard right there. Right. But uh, I think that, you know, um, culture is just becoming more and more important. And I think that as coaches, we also have to do a better job of, uh, you know, valuing that piece of leadership and also giving our and developing leaders within our teams so that they take ownership in the team and they're not always looking for the way out and they don't view it as, um, you know, just an, another um, mean to an end. And, and I think that, you know, you get to see some of, you know, some of the best leaders that we've ever seen in professional sports um, were also the most loyal to their teams. You know, you look at guys like Michael Jordan and Reggie Miller, you know, Tom, Tom Brady, I mean, regardless if he left his team, he was still with the Pats for like 20 years, you know, I mean, like, he, he, he was all bought into that culture. Um, and I think that, you know, for us, we're not um, iconic more than like four years at our level, you know, sometimes two years at our level. And so I think that it's one of those things where you get them to buy into the culture, and you give them parts of the team, so that if they are faced with that, leaving part that it's like tugging at their heart it's not some just straight business decision where well you know I got offered a salary of this much or I got offered you know four shooting machines instead of two or whatever it is you know um, that they're part of a culture that they're it's, it's like a family they love it um, they they hurt when they don't meet whatever the standard of the of the team is and that ultimately they fall in love with winning and I think when you can get someone to fall in love with winning and you're following through on that end of the deal, that'd be a pretty hard program to meet, to leave in my opinion. All right. So let's tie this in. Then we're going to go back. All right. You first started and how you have developed your culture over time, right? It, it's got to start somewhere. And now you're to a point where you have it pretty established. So how did you start it and how has it developed over time? Yeah, when I when I first got um, to UAA, I just I just knew that I wanted, you know, I in my college career, I played for four coaches in um, four years. And 
I, I stayed at the same place. So I, I, it wasn't by my choice, I guess maybe they didn't like coaching me and they left. Right. So, um, I, I never, I got to experience different types of cultures, but nothing that was really long lasting. And the one that, um, you know, there was one that I, it was kind of a Bobby Knight situation where it was, you know, you just showed up and you did your work and, and, you know, there was a lot of emphasis placed on, you know, being early and working hard and staying late. And then the next person that came in was, um, you know, a little bit more led by fear. And so you just didn't want to disappoint him, you know, uh, and we won a lot. And it, and it was almost like that Vince Lombardi thing where everybody's like kind of against the guy, you know. Um, and then the, the, the last guy that I ended up playing for, um, he's just a good, he was just a good man, you know, and it was almost like sometimes you could, you could walk over him a little bit sometimes and, and there it wasn't as much discipline as the, the guys before him. So I just thought like, man, if I could like find a healthy mix of that. Um, and, and that's kind of where I got like my, my ideas from it, just in terms of what I wanted my team to be. And that kind of reflects what your culture is. And so uh, I wanted it to be like a family. I wanted them to feel like, you know, Hey, we, even if they're in trouble on their worst day, they should fear what has what what punishment or what payment they owe us at that point, but that we have their back. You know that that we want to guide them out of whatever that probably uh, is, and that they can trust us. Like this isn't like going to the principal's office. Um, and then you know I wanted you know to to develop young people to be able to lead because when you have accountability from a peer standpoint, I feel like you will run through more walls than you will for a, for a coach. Um, and I read a book right before I, I got here, two books. One was The Gold Standard by Mike Krzyzewski when he took over uh, the, the, the dream team and what he had to do to kind of change the culture, get them to buy in, get them to understand what they were representing and what was lost before. Um, and kind of have pride in your past, which I thought ended up being really important was like having pride in the program. Um, and then the other one I read that kind of changed everything for me was Lone Survivor by Marcus Luttrell. And um, that was kind of where I got the idea of the special forces. And, um, you know, I grew up in a pretty strict household. Um, and so a lot of those things just kind of rang, rang true to me, but it wasn't necessarily like the combat part, you know, um, the kind of gory part of that and him getting captured or not getting captured but living with this you know um, kind of family in the mountains but it was more the training the buds training up to that to become a navy seal what you wanted to be and then where there's like you know six to eight guys and they're fighting 150 you know um soldiers and there's just no doubt in their mind they're going to win like the guy gets shot in the head and he's like, no, I'm good. You know, we're, we're still, we got these guys, you know? And it's like, whoa, you know, your, your, your mental toughness has to be out of this world to go through something like that. And in, the, in, and in your mind, not even have to convince yourself of it, but like the whole time you just believe that you're going to win. And those, those parts, I really feel of, of that culture, we've kind of built in over time. Um, and a lot of that has to do with what we do in the preseason. Um, we don't do a lot of you know, putting in our plays and stuff like that in the first six weeks. We're developing leaders and we're developing competitors during that time. And the lesson I learned this year is you got to reteach that every single year because that's just not some people. And I think especially uh, in young athletes, they're just not wired that way. It's a special, rare competitor that just, you know, goes home and is still that person. You know, um, that's why not everybody can make Bud's training and be in the special forces because they ultimately submit, you know, they find the point where they're just like, I'm not willing to do that anymore. So that's kind of what we've we really focused on in our culture. All right. So I want to add to that then. Obviously, you have a very special culture, right? So when you're 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 adding assistance or looking to bring people in to your coaching staff, um you know, how do you look for those people who are going to, you know, build on that and add to that and, and kind of ride along with you? I think it, for, for me, it's got to be someone that I just, I trust with a great deal. Um, and that, um, 
you know, in the past, you know, I've been very fortunate because my assistant's been with me since day one. I mean, we, we built this thing together and, and learned the hard way together and all that. Um, but I think the most helpful assistants that we've had, you know, have just been players, ex-players from the program. And I probably learned more from them during the time than I would, you know, researching on my own or, you know, they'll come up and they'll say, well, coach, you know, you know, we'll talk, we'll just be complete. We all do it. All of us coaches will go back to our office and complain about we're just so terrible. You know, our kids don't play hard anymore. I don't know what we're doing, you know, and, and the ex player will say, well, do you remember when we did this, this was absolutely awful, but we went through it and we, you know, we competed, you know, or used to do this to us and you're getting soft and I mean, Oh yeah, I forgot, you know, like, yeah, yeah, let's let, okay. Let's tweak it for like nowadays, but like, let's do, you know, um, so like, you know, I, I remember when I first started coaching, someone didn't take a charge, right? So we had a couple of players line up and stick them, you know, there on the on the uh, restricted area and, and got to run into them and take a charge, you know. And now it's like, okay, if you did that with like more than like one or two times, I, I don't think you'd have a job anymore. So what we did was we, we took a kid, she was our All-American, but man, it was like, uh, Olay, you know, uh, like the, the bullfighters when someone would come through, she just would take a charge. So we took her up to the gymnastics. Uh, we have a big gymnastics facility and they have a foam pit. And so we, we put her on the edge of the runway where, where the um, vault would be. And we just had someone just run into her. So she fell into the foam pit and we did, we did that about five or six times. So it was fun. She was laughing and everything, but I was like, okay, that's, that's what it's going to feel like to take a charge, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's just some of those things like that. So I think it's interesting, you know, we, we really talked about the culture and, and you referenced a couple of books, a book I, I read recently and I, I was talking to, we had Mike Neighbors on from Arkansas the other day. It, it kind of talked about, you know, the difficulties of being a head coach is called the tough stuff. And it talked about the idea of imposter syndrome. Um, you know, have you ever felt, you know, as the head coach, whether, you know, maybe it was a lot more during your first year, but do you ever feel like, man, am I, am I really ready to be the head coach? Did I make the right decision there? Do I, do I still, do I still think that I was right in this game when I did this? You know, do you still have those feelings now of that imposter syndrome? Has that kind of gone away? Did you kind of have that your first year? Maybe it's a flaw of mine, but I always do. You know, I, um, we've all said you, the same. Yeah. When I, when I played, um, I remember my first game, um, I, I, before I went overseas, I, I kind of played in a, you know, it was like the CBA at the time before it went defunct. And, um, I was playing against a really good player and I just couldn't get a shot off. I couldn't do anything. And I thought, man, I, maybe I'm not good enough. You know, maybe this isn't, I thought, I thought I was way better than this. And, I think as a coach, it's the same thing, you know, um, I think in the last six years right now, we're whatever, 180 something and 17 or something like that. And um, all 17 of those times, I felt like I'm done. I can't, I can't do this. Can't relate to my players anymore. Um, you know, I, I can't handle this feeling. And, um, you know, and there, shoot, after the three games this year, I felt the same. We won and I felt the same way, like, you know what, I'm, I'm not doing something right. I lost it, you know, and, and then you go back and you watch it like, okay, okay, I got it. This is what we need to do. This is what we need to do. But I think your, your immediate emotion is that kind of imposter syndrome. But I think, you know, the good coaches and I think the good players, you know, just as importantly, um, you're able to recognize, like the first thing in doing that to me is I read another book um, this, this year that really helped is called Extreme Ownership. And it's a, also a Navy SEALs book, but um, just like immediately taking ownership in whatever the flaw was, like, it, and it could have been something, but finding a way where it's your fault as the head, as the head coach, as the head coach um, or the coaching staff, where just like, no, this, this is on me and I'm going to find a reason and I'm going to find a way to fix this because this is what I do. Um, now, if we went through five or six losses in a row and I still couldn't figure it out, then yeah, that, that imposter syndrome would really bother me a little bit. Um, you know, and I think it's different for high school and, and college um, because high school, you don't get to make your own bed. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you know, you might get 
a pair of twos, a, a, you know, a, a, a queen of spades, you know, or, and, and, and a 10, and you got to play that hand. Three, Joker, could, three jokers and an empty card. <laughs> you know, we get to pick it. And there's some years that are better than others where we, you know, we hit our top recruits each time and, um, you know, just get naturally competitive kids that we didn't know what their heart was in the recruiting process. And they just ended up being really special in that regard. Um, but we have more control over that. And I think, honestly, I think the people that would probably deal with the imposter syndrome more would be the high school coaches. Um, because you're dealing, I mean, you may win state one year with two or three division one, II, division two II players and just kick everybody's butt and you're pressing and you're going, and then you get some, some slow foot kids that can't press anymore. And you try to do that. You're like, Oh man, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to teach us anymore. You know? So I, I definitely think that's, that's the case. Um, and I, I could definitely see that more common at the high school level. All right. We're going to go X's and O's now. We're, we're going to finally, we, I think we've had like, I don't even know how many questions we've asked you in the two episodes and we we're finally getting to really into the X's and O's. And to be honest, that's a credit to you because that this is an awesome episode uh, and, and what you're giving us here. But, uh, but we're talking about man, we're, we're going to start installing it, right? Cause this is always the big debate, whether it's whole, whether it's whole part whole, whether, you know, you know, you got new players in, you got people you're trying to develop. Um, how do you start putting your mayhem system in? Well, the, the, the first part, and I, I learned this this year, was that, that competitive part. It's just one-on-one. -on -one, we're doing conditioning. That's you, you, Your body has to be ready for it um, because if you're going to put this system in, you have to be willing to put your team through some tough stuff. And there's certain tests that they have to meet the standard to get onto the floor. If they can't do it, they will do it over and over and over and over and over again. And some people call that old school. Some people want to agree with it. I don't really care. That's what it's, that's what it takes to, to, to do this. But if we're going to install it, I'm a whole part whole guy. So I'll show them, you know, we'll put our press in and I'll show them the two, two, one. And I'll kind of talk about the responsibilities of what each kind of player and the characteristics of that player has. So X1 needs to be your best on-ball defender. You know, X2 is going to be your second best on-ball defender. And that may be your, your three, you know, on offense. You know, when I recruit players, I tell them, offensively, you'll never be in a box. I'm going to tell you what every coach in the country tells you. But defensively, you are, you're going to be 1,000% in a box. So I, I am putting you in a very specific position in this. And these, these are the characteristics that I believe that you have. And these are the characteristics that you need to, you know, really refine and get great at. So we'll, we'll put them in that and we'll put them through different drills. So your three and your four, your four will be a little bit more athletic. Your four is probably going to match your four on offense. It will be kind of that second kind of post or your biggest guard if you're a four guard offense. And then um, typically my X3 is like the shooters. So I think, I think we can all kind of read between the lines and what the shooter is because um, it's kind of the same for, for most teams, a little slower afoot. Um, might be a little bit better rebounder, but it, defensively, that's the person you're kind of hiding a little bit. Um, and then X5, it kind of doesn't matter in terms of personnel of athletic ability. So if the less athletic ability that they have, the more rules you give them. And the, the, the more athletic ability that that X5 player has, the less rules that I'll give them and I'll kind of let them make plays and stuff like that. So that's kind of how we do it. And then we break it down. We go a one-on-one -on -one zigzag competition. Uh, well, one-on-one -on -one zigzag to begin, because that, that would be a, a part. And then we make it competitive where you're not shooting, but you're staying within the lane line, what we call the river and the sideline out of bounds. And each time the offense beats the defense, that's one point for the O. And then they slow up and they let the defense catch up to them. And if the defense creates a turnover, they get a bobble, they get whatever they want, then that's a, that's a point for the defense. And if they steal it, they put it down in an area that they want. So we always say it pays to be a winner. So if you knock it out and you go get the loose ball, then you can put that loose ball in a, you can't put it at the very beginning, but if you want to put it 10 feet back from where you stole it, you get to do it because you won that. So they get it, they go through that. And then we do one where it's a zigzag to just past half court, you pass to a coach and the offense will go down to the wing and then pop back up and you're in a denial position into on-ball defense so that you're working on your half-court principles um, 
to get them used to not giving up the middle and stuff like that. So then we go like a two on two run and jump um, with the ones and the twos. And then we just kind of build that. So we go one on one, two v two, three v three. And then um, I'll kind of skip four just so the fives can get in there and we can kind of go over what that is. And then we kind of have our press um, for the for the mayhem part of it. And then amoeba is kind of the same thing. You know, we put it all in, we show them it's a one, one, three. Uh, we talk about, you know, great teams, you know, elite defensive teams can fix a bad situation after one pass. So we really place a heavy emphasis on communication. Um, and then we'll do different breakdown drills in our amoeba where we kind of go over the unique rotations that amoeba has and then run and jump scenarios that we can get into with our guards. All right, so I, that, I think that's kind of the interesting part because uh, John and I, we've talked about it, we're zone, we're zone guys. But like, I think the interesting part is putting your players in positions to see different things. Because obviously you guys have been doing it, you've been successful. So I'm sure there's coaches trying anything and everything, right? So I, I guess, how do you best prepare your players for to communicate those different things? And how do you show it to them in practice? And how do you, I guess, test them and, and challenge them to be ready for kind of whatever anybody shows up? You know, we have like our own, um, our own vocabulary for things. You know, I, I, I also tell them to talk on defense like they're at the playground. You know, um, we, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, um, we have like a, you know, if it's a bad ball handler, we'll, we'll identify those players as geeks. Um, we'll, um, you know, and if it's a, if it's a post that we're, you know, uh, really concerned about, you know, that'll be a player that we dig on. And, and I, and I think it's, you know, it's nothing real, you know, out of this world kind of, kind of things it's, but we want to be really specific on the difference between a dig and a double. Um, if we're, if we believe that there's a ball handler that will melt, then those are the, the people that will probably trap more often than not. Um, because we won't necessarily look to trap the really elite players. I think the higher level you go, the more you do that, the more an elite player can punish you. Um, so we'll look to find the, the slowest zebra, right? Like we'll, we'll trap that one first before we try to go mess around with the, the, the fastest one. So um, there's, there's some certain things that we, that we look for uh, there, um, you know, but yeah, there's, it's very rare. You know, we'll, we'll usually have one or two players that kind of they understand the top of the zone and that they also could play the bottom of the zone. Um, but we recruit in a way where, you know, we always have at least two X5. We always have at least two X4. Uh, and then I have one or two players that we'll use as like a Swiss Army knife and they can kind of play the one, two or the three. So we'll have just in case of foul trouble or injury or something like that. So uh, before I get to my, my next question, I, I, I just finished a, a YouTube video myself. We kind of run a two, three amoeba. And I know you and I have talked about amoeba before, just set up different scenarios. Do you, have you ever had a player that's come to you and said like, well, coach, I'm really comfortable in this one spot. I don't, you know, there might be a game foul trouble, whatever reason that they end up in so-and-so spot. And they're like, coach, I've never repped this spot. I don't know what to do like or i'm not comfortable here you know does that situation ever come up for you and, and kind of how do you go through that no it will it will come up more with like the fours and the fives at times um you know we'll have some fives on our team that you know there is a couple lineups we'll put like a jumbo package in or something and we'll play our a couple of our fives at the same time and then we'll move a four over to a three and the four and the three are for us it's the same rules but you're not always going to guard the same action. So if you were playing three the whole the whole game and their main action is is all on the left side or they they run their offense more on the left side and you've been playing on the opposite and all your reps have been going on that side, then yeah, I've had that a couple of times where it's you know we we get flipped in some way or we come out of our press and our and our three and our four get flipped a little bit. Um, yeah, that's that's happened and you know we've we've talked about ways where we can just make sure that that we end up on the side that we're supposed to um, if it was an in-game adjustment. But one thing that we really worked on in practice is that we'll run whatever action that that team is doing on both sides of the floor, regardless of what we've seen on film, just in case. 
So in our last two segments, we've kind of changed them up for season two. The first segment, we, we're going to kind of call our 30-second timeout. So it's your platform to talk about anything you want, tell your listeners about your program or speak about something you're passionate about, maybe an outside organization or charity you're involved with, a story from the season, anything you want to talk about the next 30 or so seconds, the, the floor is yours. Um. You know, there's not necessarily a, you know, a, a charity um, that, you know, I've, I've given to, you know, mostly ones with, um, that has to do with cancer, just because that's kind of touched my family. Um, and I'm uh, ultra sensitive to, you know, when, when I hear those stories about the big C. So I, I always make sure to uh, give when I can there. Um, but I, I, so I, I don't really have one that I'm, I, I can like, you know, jump out and say, oh, support, you know, this particular charity. Um, but I just think, you know, with, uh, with, with our team and with, with our program specifically, just that, um, you know, I'm, I'm just excited about, you know, next year and, and the ability to, to be able to compete and that, you know, us as a country right now, it, it looks like, um, you know, things are starting to improve a little bit and, um, that I think that one thing that I think our, uh, our country, at least I hope, uh, one thing that has given us a lot of hope has been athletics um, at, at the collegiate level, at the, uh, the high school level, at the, at the professional level, and how we have seen that how this impacts uh, their mental well-being, especially people that, you know, um, probably more so at the college and professional level, but every high school team probably has three or four that are just really, really committed to it and identify themselves as so-and-so basketball player. Um, and I just think is, you know, as we move forward in this, you know, just to be supportive of, of one another, um, you know, I, I think that it's made me, it's changed my mindset a little bit just in terms of the value of athletics for young people, but to support, you know, other programs and other initiatives that they have to, to get people back on the playing field. I know some, there were some states that didn't even get to compete. I know I'm going to Hawaii in two days to make an in-home visit. Um, and that, you know, that whole state didn't even get to play in their high school basketball season. So, you know, just finding ways to, to you know, get these kids out there and, and competing and playing and, you know, learning the lessons that, that they, uh, um, they get in, in athletics, but also to, for some of them to go to that happy place, you know, um, to be around people that all share the same passion they do and, and to be around coaches that are, you know, there to support them and, and uh, provide some stability. So that'll be my, my 30 second time out. All right. So our last segment, we did top five last time. Now we're doing quick hitters, just kind of rapid fire questions. Uh, some basketball, some just fun. Um, my first one is, all right, Celtics, uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, 3.5 seconds. Uh, they're on the line. Shooting, shooting two. Marcus Smart missed the first free throw. Now, there's a whole video, like it was a big YouTube thing of they told him to, to miss the second. Um, so would you miss the second, make? What is your philosophy on that? And, and were they up or down? They were up. And they were up like, I think they were up one. They were up one. So and he did missed the, the first. Did they have a timeout? Uh, I don't believe so. I, th I think they ended up trapping him in the corner, but yeah, I don't they didn't have a timeout. Yeah, yes. I think it was three seconds, no timeouts. They were oh, three up one. seconds. Yeah, 3.5, three seconds, no timeouts. They're up one. He misses the first, shooting two. Brad Stevenson missed the second. I think that I would clear the lane and miss the second. Yeah. Um, but Brad Stevens is a lot better coach. So whenever <laughs> he did, I'd have to. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to watch that back. <laughs> well, I, uh, yeah, we can send it to you. I think they ended up maybe even trapping off the guy that's who got pretty the smart. rebound. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty smart. That's why it's Brad Stevens and not us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> all right, so we got your favorite NBA and WNBA player. Give us one each growing up or, or even now. Your favorite NBA player, WNBA player of all time. By far and away, my favorite NBA player of all time. Uh, Rex Chapman and locker charge. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, uh, watching him play. Um, that was a player. I felt like I could be like at, at some point and I would say, I would tape his games on VHS and, you know, your coach would always say, find someone and 
everybody would say, oh, it's Michael Jordan. It's, you know, it's, it's Kim Olajuwon. And I just felt like, yeah, I can't, I can't do those things. Now, Rex was crazy athletic, right? But like at the twilight of his career, you know, it, it was more realistic. He was more relatable to a guy like me. So um, I just remember the shot that he hit uh, for the Phoenix Suns against the Supes growing up in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, he, he hit that crazy one legger and I practiced that shot and, and, you know, he just had, he just had like floaters in his game and he was crafty and he could really shoot threes and he talked trash to Michael Jordan. He had 38 on MJ, you know, the guy, he could hoop. So he was, he was the, uh, a hope for, for a guy like me. So yeah, I really liked him. WNBA. Um, you know, I didn't really, to be honest with you, I didn't really watch too much of it growing up because it just had, um, kind of started. Um, yep. but the, the more, you know, I, I got to see, um, you know, uh, I, you know, I guess the more that I got exposed to the, the player that I was just always most impressed with was uh, Cheryl Swoops. Um, she just was the first one that jumped out to me. I was like, man, she plays like a guy, you know, she's, she's just at a different level. All right. You can pick either one of these. You're in Alaska, obviously. A lot, there, there's a certain time where it's light all the time. Right. And there's a certain yeah. time where it's dark a lot of the time. So pick one when it's light, like, how do you how do you figure out the sleeping right because it's light all the time or when it's dark all the time how do you stay awake um so the dark one so i love the dark uh i the, the downtown anchorage is the best in the winter time there's christmas lights they have a little ice skating rink in like the central park area um they got you know a bunch of uh like uh kind of christmas market things uh but the hardest part about winter is waking up in the morning because you wake up about eight like a normal person and it will be pitch dark outside and you're just thinking like man I'm just grinding it today you know um so that's the hardest part uh and then when it's light um you do, I have to get blackout shades because it's you know it'll kind of the, the the worst that will get is like dust you know um in the in the summertime but, but those are yeah that's that's how I handle both of those all right so we're no I'm curious best food in Alaska or best food in the Anchorage area? Yeah, great food. I would say the only city that I've been that has better food than us is San Francisco. Um, man, I'm, right, I'm going to give them a shout out here. Uh, so the best food, it's, it's, uh, it's a place called Fletcher's and it's in the Hotel Captain Cook. And the Hotel Captain Cook has three restaurants in it. It's, this, it's where the teams for the shootout stay. It's, I live downtown, so it's just right up the road from where we live. It overlooks the water. It's beautiful. But they have the best ribeye steak. Um, there's a place called Double Musky, too, and it's out in Girdwood, and it's a little shack with, like, good Cajun food. But I'm just a downtown guy, and I, and I like a good old-fashioned and a ribeye. So that's, that's my best place. All right, last one here. Wildest animal you've seen in your front yard? <laughs> well, if I said moose that would be true and and that would be what everybody would think but the wildest one because they're really hard to find um is a lynx so lynx are like see? they don't come out you don't ever see them but i saw a lynx in my front yard one time yeah. that, that's that's pretty good I, I was going to be disappointed if you said like a rabbit or something you know but, but. <laughs> no moose shoot my moose? wife and i we were walking outside and she was on her phone texting and she walked right out the door and there was a moose probably five feet. Five. I was like, hey, there's a moose, right? Like, you got to be careful. Oh, and she brought out her phone and started, you know, so. Right. Moose would probably be the stereotypical Alaskan animal, right? I, I yeah. guess. I mean, I don't know. We yeah, live, they're we live in Illinois. All so. so, well, coach, uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, um, you know, having you back. Um, we, we got in some awesome topics. I, I think we kind of uh, added to some things we had talked about before. Um, so we really appreciate you coming on. Um, look forward to, you know, kind of next season and, and, you know, getting back into basketball and, and seeing what you guys are doing in the summer and the recruits you bring in. So thank you very much for being on. Uh, we appreciate it so much. Hey, thank you. And, you know, I'm, I, like I said, I'm just really uh, fortunate to be able to, you know, have this platform with you guys. And then obviously the, the coaches you guys got coming in after me, I, or before me, uh, that was that was a pretty good crowd just to be on the same little tweet with. So yeah, good good job with you guys there. That that was that's pretty cool.
Thank you for listening to another episode of the After the Timeout podcast, hosted by Todd Zazadil and John Plicky. For more show content and upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter at After the Timeout or subscribe to our podcast for upcoming episodes. For show inquiries, you can email us at afterthetimeout at gmail.com. You can find all of our previous episodes on Anchor, Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public, Pocket Cast, Google Podcast, and Apple Podcast by searching after the timeout. We appreciate you listening. Tune in next time for more basketball content on the court, off the court, and anything in between.